Well, aloha everyone, and welcome to today's lecture on the skin for Anatomy 151 here at Chaminade University. The skin is also known as the integumentary system, and the organs of the system include the skin as well as all associated accessory structures. That's going to include the hair, the nail, and sur surface glands, as well as blood vessels and muscles and nerves. Now, the integumentary system is responsible for being the first protective layer of the body against any sort of attack. So it maintains the body's integrity. It's going to help keep out foreign microbes, etc. It's also going to be responsible for temperature maintenance. And it also converts inactive vitamin D to its active form in the presence of sunlight and provides sensory information, so tactile information that lets you know that you've touched something hot or that it's cold or that you stepped on something sharp. Um, and last but not least, it helps to maintain homeostasis by being that protective barrier. Now there are three major layers of the skin. The outer layer is the epidermis. You may have heard that old joke there, hey, your epidermis is showing, right? And that's true because your epidermis is always showing, at least if you're showing any sort of skin on your body at all. Um, the inner layer, um, or the next layer down, is called the dermis. And the subcutaneous layer is also known as the sub-Q layer, and that's also called the hypodermis. And all of that is found underneath the dermis. For the purposes of this class, we're going to call it the epidermis, the dermis, and the sub-Q layer. And now I know there's a lot to take in here, but don't worry. I'm going to walk you through everything, and then we're going to actually go through each of these independently as well. So the major regions, this is the epidermis, this is the dermis, and this is the sub-Q layer. And while you do have an actual distinctive barrier between the epidermis and the dermis, you can see that if you were to pull it back, you'd actually have these rugged layers called dermal papillae. And that's to help protect the skins from being able to be shore, sheared off, right, if you were to pull on it. It also allows it to have a little bit of stretch, so you're able to move the skin around a little bit, gives it some flexibility. And also, it, it, additively, it also gives it great strength. Um, this should be kind of obvious. Here's a hair shaft, and if you follow one of the hair shafts all the way down, you're going to get to the hair follicle. The hair follicle is a round side. Here's the hair root. This whole thing is going to be called the hair bulb. We'll talk about that separately. Um, alongside that, we also are going to have an oil gland. So oil glands often are going to go right along the hair shaft, and they're going to secrete oil along the hair, and it's going to be secreted out um, along this region. Uh, another secretory region here is a sweat pore. So a sweat pore is going to look different from a sebaceous gland. And if you look down here, this is an apocrine gland. It's a sweat gland. It's a form of apocrine secretion. And then it's going to have to go all the way out through this to be able to reach the external environment. All right, some other things to note here. These are blood vessels, obviously. Um, so it's going to be your arteries and your venous return. So arteries in red. And at this point, though, it's all going to be much smaller than that. So arterioles and venules um, might even be a capillary layer. But the, anyway, veins in general are going to be shown as um, blue. So venous return is blue. And arteries are generally always going to be shown as red. Uh, we also have this area here, which is the sub-Q layer underneath the dermis. And that's all going to be comprised of adipose tissue. So a nice fatty layer there as well. Um, some other things to pay attention to are some, some sensory information. So this here is a corpuscle that's involved in deep touch. This is a corpuscle of touch with a Messner's corpuscle, it's called. And you can see we have touch receptors at both the superficial levels and also at the deeper levels. And then these are going to get relayed through um, information through the nervous tissue, which again is going to be shown here. Sensory nerves are generally going to be shown in yellow. All right, so let's move on. We're going to talk about each of these kind of independently, but just to give you an overview of some of the structures of the skin, it's a nice little diagram here. Now, doctors who treat any of the disorders of the skin are called dermatologists, and here's the different layers of burn. So a superficial burn, like a sunburn, only affects the epidermis. Sure, it's painful, but it's not going to reach these deeper levels of touch, right? Um, the Second degree burns, something like a blister, for example, like you've touched something really hot, like the stove or boiling water has splattered up or bacon grease has popped up, um, that might form a little blister, which means that we've gotten down into the dermal layer as well. So the second degree burn is going to affect the epidermis and the dermis. And a third degree burn is the highest level of burn, and that means that we've affected the epidermis, the dermis, and the sub-Q layer. And you can see this is a layer of actual dead tissue down here. It's going to go all the way through the skin into the layers beneath the skin. All right, so let's talk about the epidermis. Remember, this is the upper layer of the skin. The epidermis has four major types of cells. Keratinocytes, which as you might imagine, create keratin. Um, melanocytes, which make melanin. You may know melanin as the color of your skin as related to the amount of melanin that's produced by these particular cells. So when you get tan, for example, and your skin gets a little bit darker, that's because the melanocytes are creating more melanin to help protect you from the sun's UV rays. So in response to exposure to the sun, you'll end up with a darker skin tone. 
Um, we also have intraepidermal macrophages. They're called Langerhans cells. You may remember macrophages from when we previously were talking about them being part of the immune system, and we'll talk about them later when we get to the immune system le uh, lecture. But anyway, macrophages are going to be involved in destroying foreign invaders, or at least alerting the immune system to the fact that these foreign invaders are present. And last but not least, in fact, very importantly, these are tactile cells. And tactile cells are going to be cells that are directly connected to um, a sensory neuron. And that would mean that we would be able to pass information on if we have pressure or heat or cold, so temperature, pressure, et cetera, are all going to be passed on to these tactile epithelial cells um, through the nervous system passed on from the new, um, tactile cells to the nervous system, I apologize. Um, as I mentioned, keratinocytes make keratin. Keratin is a very fibrous protein. It's a very protective protein. It's very strong. Uh, melanocytes make the pigment melanin, which is going to, again, cause their skin tone to get darker. Um, you can also see these in ladies in, like, the age spots on your face as you get older. Those are going to be um, where we have melanocytes that kind of go haywire. And we also have intraepidermal macrophages, and again, they're involved in the immune response, and they're going to tell the body that we have a foreign invader that's come in and alert their immune system that we need to respond. And then tactile simply means sensation of touch, so tactile epithelial cells are going to be cells that are connected to nervous tissue and are going to respond to different tactile sensations by passing that information on to the nervous system. Alright, so let's talk about different types of skin. We have two major types of skin. The thin skin is the skin that covers almost all of your body. The only exceptions are going to be the palms of your hands, the palmar surfaces of your digits, the soles of your feet, and the digits, the, the, the solar digits of your feet. Um, and the thin skin is going to be everything else, right? So it's going to cover your, the rest of your body. And the difference between thin and thick skin is that thin skin has four layers and thick skin has five layers. So there's an additional layer of skin found on your palms and on the soles of your feet. And that's because these areas are going to be an, um, engaging in rough activity, right? They're going to actually be doing a lot of the work for your body. And so we want to make sure that they're a little bit better protected than the rest of your skin. So they're going to be stronger because they have that extra layer. So again, we have five layers total, four of which are present in thin skin, and that fifth only in thick skin. And if we're going from deep to superficial, and so what I mean is this is the surface that you would see and touch with your hands, and this would be the surface that would be touching the dermal layer. All right, so from the deepest, so just layering on top of the dermal layer is the stratum basal. Working our way up, we have the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, and then the stratum lucidium is only present in thick skin. So it's going to be that additional layer that's found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And then on top of that, which is the entire body, is this layer, which is, again, the area that is going to be exposed to the outside environment, is the stratum corneum. All right, and what does this look like? Again, this is the epidermis. This is the, the external layer of your skin. Um, and there's actually a lot, there's a pretty large layer of dead keratinocytes that are on top. So these guys are going to be cells that are going to be dead scales that are just going to be sloughing off. And so the upper layers of your skin are mainly comprised of dead keratinocytes. Um, and that's going to be what's found in the stratum corneum. These cells are not living, and you can actually give them pretty good pressure, good scratch, and they're not going to respond too much because they're pretty much entirely dead. Underneath that, we have the stratum lucidium. You can consider these the cells that are pretty old or freshly dead. They're on their way to becoming the stratum corneum, right? You can picture that all of these cells are going to be created here and work their way through these different layers until we end up as the top layer of the epidermis, which is, again, the stratum corneum. On um, the stratum granulosum is the third layer down. They have laminar granules here. Um, and these guys are on their way out. These are in cellular senescence. They're dying. Um, they are about to become the lucidium and then become the corneum. Underneath that, we have the keratinocytes. Right? Hidden within the keratinocytes, we have these macrophage cells that are intraepidermal. And intra just meaning in the side of, epidermal meaning epidermal layer. So they're going to be found all throughout the epidermal layer. And these are macrophages. Uh, macrophages, again, are going to be responsible for the immune response, so they're going to be very helpful. Um, and they're going to be important in making sure that, well, they're basically the peacekeepers of the cell to make sure that anything that is a foreign invader is going to get attacked or at least alert the immune system. And again, because the skin is always constantly exposed to the external environment, it isn't that big of a leap to think that a foreign invader might make in here. So these macrophages are going to be kind of the second line of defense if you consider that this barrier function is the first line of defense to any sort of invaders in the cell. Uh, sorry, to the surface of the skin. Lastly, we have here these tactile cells. These tactile cells shown in purple are going to be directly next to the sensory neuron, which is going to have a tactile disc that aligns with the whole tactile epithelial cell. And this, in combination, the two of these together are going to be responsible for passing information on in terms of temperature and pressure and other sensations. Here at the very bottom, we have the stratum basal, 
And in the stratum based cell, we have melanocytes. And melanocytes, again, are the ones that are going to be making melanin. And this is all just a diagram depiction. Over here, we have an actual image. Remember, we have the dermal papillae, so that's here, up and down. And again, in the order from the external environment on our way down, that's the stratum corneum. Stratum lucidium found here. These guys are anucleotic. Why? Because they're dead in this case and dying slash freshly dead here. Um, and then these guys, the stratum granulosum, are on their way out. They're going to be dying shortly. They also, again, they have the laminar granules. You can actually see the laminar granules. And that's indicating that they're under the process of, of dying. Um, underneath that, we have the stratum spinosum. That's here, that goes all the way down into these ridges. And then at the very bottom layer, we have the stratum base cell, which is going to line right along that epidermal ridge right here. This here is showing that touch corpuscule that we were just seeing here. It's showing a cross section of the tactile disc. So that's going to be a combination of the tactile epithelial cell, which is going to be right here somewhere, it's not really depicted, and the um, tactile disc in the sensory neuron, which is going to pass information on into the nervous system in terms of pressure, temperature, etc. So as I may have mentioned, um, melanocytes, they're going to be um, the melanin-producing cells. They're found, again, in that stratum basal here. That's going to be the basal layer, right, the stratum basal. And we can have some problems with the production of melanin. So if we have something called albinism, for example, an albino individual is going to have no pigment in their skin, their hair, or their eyes because they're unable to produce melanin. Another example of a, um, something on haywire in the pigments is going to be vitiligo. It's going to be a disorder where we have patches of depigmented regions, so basically partial albinoism in regions of the skin. And it's not exactly known why, but it is known that it's genetic, and then also it uh, is coupled with immune system disorder, so it's classified as an autoimmune disease. All right, so underneath the epidermis, we have the next layer, and that's called the dermis. The dermis is mainly connective tissue, generally collagen and elastic fiber. It has two separate regions. One is the papillary region, and that's going to lay right underneath the epidermis, right? We call those papillae, so that's why it's the papillary region. Um, and then we have the reticular region, which is going to be mainly connective tissue, dense connective tissue that's irregular. It has a lot of reticular fibers in there. Underneath that, so this is going to be, so here's the epidermis. This is the dermis that we were just talking about that. Underneath that, we have the subcutaneous layer. We're going to call that the sub-Q layer for the rest of this lecture. But the sub-Q layer is also called the hypodermis. So if you ever read hypodermis, it would just be underneath the dermis. And it's also going to attach the skin, which would be up here, right, the top part, to the underlying tissues and organs underneath that. So it's basically like a layer of tissue that's going to connect the two regions. Now, as I just mentioned, we had tactile um, sensory receptors, and we have two different ones. We have the superficial type and the deep type, and they're found in the region that they're called different uh, names is because they're found in the two different layers, right? So the ones that are found in the upper layer or the superficial layer are going to be type 1. They're called mechanoreceptors, and these basically are um, for touch or pressure of the hair root plexus. So if the hair root plexus detects pressure, then you're going to be able to have that information passed on. And then the deep ones are going to be for more pressure, um, something that's going to be more of an intense and that's, those are called laminated corpuscles. And they're not so good at detecting temperature changes so much as pressure changes. And we just demonstrated one of those a second ago when we talked about them. So some of the accessory structures, I'm going to include things like hair, right? So it's going to be a, a overall hair shaft, and then a bulb, and then a root, right? Um, and then follicle right here. And then this is a nail, is also an accessory structure of the skin. And we'll talk about each of those independently in just a second. So hair is present almost the entire surface of the body. Now, some regions more than others, right? Men on your upper lip, for example, for most of us on the tops of our heads, um, and also end up with our armpits and groin regions. So we do end up with more hair in certain regions than in other regions, um, but there are areas that are generally hair exempt, and that's going to be anywhere that we have that fifth layer of skin. So the palms, the anterior surfaces of your fingers, the soles of your feet, and the bottom part of your toes are not ever going to grow hair. Um, um, and hair is basically a series of epidermal cells that have died, and they had a ton of keratin, so keratin is very strong, and so it's basically just comprised of long layers of epidermal cells that have been keratinized. And depending on your genetics, you could have a different thickness, different color, different distribution of that hair. It could be curly, it could be um, straight. So genetics are going to determine the thickness and distribution of the hair. Now, when we're looking at the anatomy of a hair, we have multiple parts of a hair, including the shaft, which is everything above the skin surface, the follicle, which is everything below the skin level, um, and the root that's going to penetrate 
into the dermis, right? And that's going to include the root sheath, which is epithelial and dermal. So we have two major regions of the root sheath as well. And this is just a scanning electron micrograph demonstrating um, cuticle cells, which are going to be surrounding the hair shaft. So this is what a hair shaft looks like, right? The hair shaft is going to go down into the hair bulb. It's oftentimes connected to that sebaceous gland, which is going to secrete um, oil, right, out through that hair root. So that root is going to have both the shaft and whatever oil is coming out through that sebaceous gland, so whatever secretions. We also have a specialized muscle here that's connected down to the bulb, and that's called the erector pili muscle. And that's what helps your hair to stand up on end, right? And so that muscle, when it tightens down, you kind of get that tingling feeling and all your hair stands on end. That's because at that moment, your body has decided it needs to increase its tactile response for whatever reason. And so it's heightened its tactile response by erecting those erector pili muscles. Additionally, here's a sweat gland, which again is going to be different from an oil gland. Um, and then here we have papillae of the hair, which is going to be on um, this region here where we're going to have the, um, the nervous tissue surrounding it. And the papillae is the region where the blood vessels are going to enter in and out. All right, so if we take a cross section of that, we're going to talk about all the same stuff that we just talked about, but get a little bit more in depth. So again, um, this is the root sheath, which is the external parts of the hair, right, if we're headed into the... Um, headed down into the surface of the skin is depicted here, and that's going to be the bulb, right? So the epithelial root sheath is going to be comprised of an external root and an internal root. So as we're headed inward, we're going from the dermal root sheath to the external root sheath to the internal root sheath, right? And that's all in the hair follicle. Now inside the hair root, we are going to continue in cuticle of the hair and then cortex and medulla. And you're going to hear cortex and medulla several times throughout the semester. For example, the kidney has a cortex and a medulla and the testes have a cortex and a medulla. So cortex just means external and medulla means interior um, in terms of orientation. All right, so the bulb, again, we're going to be looking at external layer all the way in. And so we're going to be looking at the same thing. We started here with dermal root sheath and worked our way in through the root epithelial root sheath. Now we're here on the bottom, look, starting with the dermal root sheath, working our way in through the epithelial root sheath. Here's the external root sheath, internal root sheath, right? All these kind of sound the same. And that's because they are, they're, all they are is penetrating into the surface of the skin. Um, and then we're going to get to the cor cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla, which all sound the same as where we were there. But now inside... We also are going to have, well, melanocytes, which are going to give us the coloration of the hair, but this hair matrix, right? And that hair matrix is going to be extending out from the bottom of the medulla, and it's going to be a region where we can have this papillae region, which is going to allow the blood vessels in and out to service that hair. All right, so let's talk about glands for a second. We have four different types of glands that are found in the skin. The first one we've already talked about is the sebaceous gland. These are oil glands. They're connected to your hair follicles. This is what gives your hair a greasy appearance after a couple days of not showering because you're continuously secreting this oil. Um, we also have sweat glands. So the, the eccrine sweat glands, these are the most numerous. We also have apocrine sweat glands. These are mainly located in more hairy skin. So you find these in the armpit region, for example. And then ceramineous glands are going to be specialized sweat glands that are only found in the ear canal. And they're going to secrete specialized um, secretion which is going to turn into earwax. So ceremonious glands are going to create earwax essentially. Um, all right, so nails. Here's nails also considered an accessory structure. It's made of keratin as well, just like your hair, but it's going to be have a diff it's going to have a different orientation. Um, and it's also made again of keratinized epidermal cells. The structures of the nail include the free edge, which is the part that you might think of if you think of a French manicure, the transparent nail body, which is this whole region here, which is called the plate. At the very bottom, you have like a half moon that you can see that's called your lunula, and that's newly synthesized um, nails. It's a little bit softer, and that's going to be the whitish region that's found at the base. Underneath that, we have the nail root. So if you've ever had a nail pulled off, you've actually had it pulled off down to the root, the nail root is embedded here in a fold of skin, which is known as the cuticle or the epiconium. Right? That's this whole region here. Um, and so underneath that, you actually have a, this particular nail-creating area that's the nail, um, well, the root's going to be there at the bed. All right, so let's take a cross-section. This might make people a little bit queasy. We've taken a sagittal plane, so we've taken a razor blade basically straight down the middle of the finger. This might look very familiar. This is the phallus. This is the finger bone, right? This is the very tip of the bone. Um, but if we're working our way outward, we're going to have the nail root, which extends into the nail matrix. 
So the nail root we just discussed, the nail matrix wasn't depicted in the previous image. The nail matrix is basically the epithelium that's just proximal to that root of the nail and has dividing cells that are going to make new nail cells. So it's basically going to be contributing to this nail root, and the nail root is just going to be pushing forward, right? And from the nail root, we're going to go underneath the cuticle or the epiconium region, right? Um, and then we're going to end up becoming the lunula, which is the basically the new newly created white part of the nail, which then eventually thickens down into the nail bed, which is this, um, sorry, the nail body, which is this part of the nail right here, which is right above the nail bed. So the nail bed and the nail matrix are basically going to be one continuous sheath here, right? Um, and then the hypoconium is the region that secures the nail to the fingertip. And then above, um, up, as we go downward from that region, we've got the epidermis and then the dermis, just like you'd expect. All right, so that's an overview of a cross-section of the nail. All right, so let's talk about what happens when your skin gets injured. All right, um, we all know that we've cut ourselves and it's healed, right? So wound healing occurs in a couple different ways, but two major kinds. And it depends mainly on the depth of the injury. How badly were you hurt? Now, if you were only hurt in the epidermis, but it didn't reach the dermis, then it's going to be a pretty easy fix. Basically, what happens is you cut down to that basement membrane, but not into the dermal layer. All right, and so you've destroyed everything in here. You've taken out, so you've taken out this whole V section. Well, then what happens are these epithelial cells, the basal epithelial cells, are just going to divide until they meet to the middle. So they're just going to divide and divide and divide until they replace that stratum basal. And then remember, they're dividing and creating more of these different layers until eventually they're just going to end up becoming the top layer and then the area of the completely dead cells. So they're going to end up thickening one layer at a time from the basement membrane, or sorry, from the cells that are adjacent to the basement membrane, right, the stratum basal. Okay, so epidermal wound healing generally does not leave a scar. Um, it generally leaves the skin pretty much the same as it was prior to the injury, although it does take a little bit of time to get it back to normal. Now, deep wound healing is going to be um, when you have an injury that enters into the dermal layer. So if that's the case, then you end up bleeding, right? So here this is showing the blood wound coming up from the clot. But blood doesn't just have blood cells, which are depicted here. It also has a bunch of clotting factors that are going to be found. And that's going to form this nice scab layer that's going to happen as we are trying to heal. Um, additionally, we're going to activate a pathway whereby the fibroblasts here are going to kind of move on in. And it's going to end up with a... Um, end up with a healing path, but it's going to heal pretty quickly. Um, here's a macrophage, or a monocyte is a specific type of macrophage. Again, this is going to be important so that we can fend off any, um, any foreign invaders. Perhaps we just cut ourselves with something that actually had microbes on it, and so the very first thing we want to do is make sure that we're killing anything that's not self in this particular area. Right? Um, we also, because we've gotten to the point where we have blood, we've probably damaged a blood vessel here, and so that's going to be secreting all of these wound factors. And so that's going to be the very first phase, or I guess immediately after the injury itself. Um, we're going to end up, it's called the inflammatory phase, and inflammation happens simply because we have um, the possibility of infection, and so a bunch of monocytes and neutrophils, et cetera, our immune cells are going to flood the area. Um, it's also going to be a time frame when it's going to end up kind of red, right, and maybe a little bit tender. And then as we get to the point where we are filling in the area that's been damaged, and we will fill that in with scar tissue, Right? So it's going to become fibrotic tissue. This is called a fibrosis. Um, and the blood vessel is going to end up with restored function. And we will have a little bit of scar tissue here, but on the surface, we're going to have resurfaced our epithelium through the process of wound healing that we just talked about over here. At the same time that we're doing that, however, because we have that scab on top, we're going to have the, this ability of this to be kind of disintegrated one piece at a time as these guys move upward, which is going to make a plug that will prevent, hopefully, um, any further infection during healing. All right, so as we age, how, do our skin, how does our skin change? Well, first and foremost, we end up with wrinkles. And why does that happen? Well, that happens because our extracellular matrix, like our hyaluronic acid, elastin, fibrinogen, is going to be underproduced compared to when we were younger. And so our skin is going to sag, and we're going to end up with divots. Um, we also end up with easy dehydration and skin cracking, so our skin junctions don't seem to hold as well. And we produce less sweat, which means that we actually are going to be more susceptible to extreme changes of temperature, which is why when they end up with rolling blackouts in the summer and elderly people can't keep their air conditioning on, they say to go check on them very regularly or to move them to places that do have air conditioning because they're unable to adapt to the increased temperatures the same way that younger people are. 
Um, they also are going to have an issue with melanocytes. And it's actually kind of unfair because they end up with less melanocytes in their hair, so you end up with gray hair, and more melanocytes or atypical melanocytes in your skin, so you end up with age spots, for example. Also, you'll end up with a loss of subcutaneous fat. Overall, you're going to be losing fat, which is almost going to get taken from the sub-Q layer. And so your skin is going to get very thin and possibly uh, a little bit more brittle, and your nails also may end up being more brittle. So unfortunately, those are just the side effects of aging. Um, another thing that happens with age is that Elderly people tend to have an increased susceptibility to what's called bed sores or pressure ulcers. So regions where the skin is simply unable to handle the pressure and just kind of sloughs off all the way down. And these need to be treated by a professional because, as you can see here, they tend to lend themselves to infection very easily, which can lead to blood poisoning or sepsis. So, um, Some other issues that may arise with the integumentary system include skin cancer. So if we are exposed to UV light from the sun, from tanning salons, etc., we can end up with abnormal skin cells developing. And then they, if they are the type of cells that will develop faster than normal cells, and then eventually what we call metastasize, which means hitch a ride on your bloodstream and end up to secondary locations, like your bone, etc., um, then they can end up being fatal. But typically, if they're caught very early, they're going to be something that has a very good survival rate in comparison to other types of cancers. Um, the major types of cancer are going to be basal cell carcinoma, um, a squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma, and that's the one that is the real kicker. So that's the one that's going to be one, the most dangerous form, and that looks kind of like this. There's a whole ABCs of how to check for um, cancer, and one of the things is, is it, um, is it irregular? Did it just come up out of nowhere? Does it have um, asymmetrical edges, right? Does it have weird borders that aren't necessarily defined? Um, and does it change? Does it change color? Is the color different, etc.? So that's one of the things that you want to look for for uh, moles that you may think have become skin cancer. So we're going to end the lecture talking about burns, and burns are going to be severe damage to either the epidermis or also the dermis, and it's basically tissue damage that's caused by multiple different things. So you think of burns, you think of excessive heat, right? You think of touching boiling water um, or uh, baking grease popping onto you, but it can also be caused by electrical impulse, which can cause intense heat as well. So you can um, touch an electrical socket and end up with severe burns. Uh, also can be caused by something like radioactivity. So after, for example, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, um, there was an immediate death rate, but then there were also secondary death rates due to the radioactivity that was released during those, um, those catastrophic events. Um, also chemicals, so you can have a chemical burn that's going to basically just destroy the proteins in the skin cells, which makes them just slough right off. And we grade burns according to their sensitivity. So first we grade them, well first we talk about their classification. So is it going to be a, a heat burn or is it a radioactive burn or is it a chemical burn? Um, and then how severe is it? And again we talked about first degree being only the epidermis, second degree including the epidermis and the dermis. This is usually when you have a blister forming. And third degree is usually going to be um, denoted by necrotic tissue. So a third degree burn is going to destroy the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. And this is usually when you're going to end up with those black lines that are shown here in these fingers. And how do we generalize how bad the burns are? So if you want to say the person has burned over X percent of their body. Um, and we use the rule of nines to do that. So this is something that you may end up seeing in the ER. Um, so basically the legs are going to be nine each, right? The arms are going to be 4.5 each, so both of them together are going to be nine, and the trunk is going to be 18 percent. Um, the very top part is going to be four and a half percent, and just one percent left over, right? That gets us to 99 percent, so the one percent is for the um, perineum. And basically, you're going to take a guesstimate of the surface area that is burned and the regions that are burned, and then put that together to have an additive summation of the estimate of the surface area that is affected by the burn. And this is only in extreme cases, obviously, but it would be useless for your medical write-up. I appreciate you guys sticking through that. You guys have a fantastic day, and happy studying. Aloha.